And we have a very, very special guest joining us again here for Memorial Day. He's kind of our go-to for these federal holidays, and he always gives us info we didn't know, and he's probably going to drop some more knowledge on us today. Joining us by phone, the man, the first lady's man, Mr. Andrew Oak. Andy, how you doing, what, bud? What is up, fellas? Always good to be here with you. Always good to celebrate, like you say, another federal holiday. Drop some knowledge on you. Talk some nonsense. Get some fun in between. And um, I know it's Memorial Day, so I've I've got a theme for you guys. And and you guys are great. It's fun to be on with you because you've always got interesting follow ups and questions of your own. And 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 that's what's fun. It's not just a just a you know rubber stamp kind of interview thing. So so I'm throwing it out here to everyone that Memorial Day, we have to think about wartime first ladies. Memorial Day, I know everyone gets their cookout on and gets their gets their drink on and has a good time, but we enjoy these freedoms in America that are provided to us by the the, the lives and sacrifices and and just relentless duty of our US military. And I always try and put that first and foremost in Memorial Day because that's what we are we are really memorializing. It's the lives of the soldiers and military members and their families that sacrifice to to give us these freedoms. And when you think about that, these men and women of the White House, even more so the women, sacrifice part of their lives for us because they think they can make life better. They try and make life better. They try and do good things for us. And these first ladies, they're not elected. And these first ladies, they are not paid. So, you know, even more so than their presidential husbands, they are giving themselves and giving of themselves and their services selfless, selflessly to be the most powerful and influential, unpaid and unelected women in the world. And we always start off with number one with Martha Washington. But this has been going on since the Revolutionary War, even before. And it summarizes the whole thesis of all of my work is that the the country of America, the modern world as we know it, with America in it, would not be, would not exist if George Washington had married anyone other than Martha Dandridge Custis. At the time, George Washington was marrying up. She had more money. She had more social status. He was a brilliant man, a military genius. He had an idea. But think about it this way, fellas. George Washington came home and said to his bride, his new wife, honey, I got a great idea. I'm going to overthrow the king and queen of England. I'm going to overthrow one of the most powerful regimes and mightiest forces and navies and armies and militia in the world because I don't feel what they're doing is right. I think we can do it better. If I came home and said to Heather sitting on my couch, honey, I got a great idea. I'm going to overthrow the U.S. government. That's what George Washington said. I'd be put on a watch list. They she would away. at least ask how much you had to drink that day. Well, for sure. And, and and Martha, Martha, when George Washington came home and said that, Martha said, okay. And then he said, I'm going to need some of your money to do it. And then he said, when I'm away, you're going to have to take care of all the fortune, all the land, all the acreage, the tobacco fields, the slaves at the time, the staff, the real estate in Williamsburg. You're going to have to take care of all that. Think of Martha Washington as the first successful female CEO of the new world, because being a housewife and being a mother is an important job. Now, one of our most important, that and teacher and a mother and a, and a housewife, they are teachers. They teach the kids, the next generation, the upbringing, the, everything that they need to do. But back then you were running a family corporation. You were responsible for how the family ate, how they clothed themselves, whether the animals were alive to get milk or get meat or get, you know, whether the orchards were bringing in fruit, these self-sustaining plantations and organizations, they were run by some of these affluent, these, these aspiring and, and, af and, and, uh, what's the word I'm, I'm looking for? Uh, 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 women of, women of aptitude, women of means, women of natural intelligence. And, and that's what most of these first ladies are. So when you think about wartime, you've got the revolutionary war. And you got women like Martha Washington, Abigail Adams. You got the Civil War, which is, you know, Julia Grant, uh, Eliza Johnson, Mary Todd Lincoln, 
uh, 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 Rutherford, uh, Lucy, Lucy Hayes, Ida McKinley, uh, all these women. Uh, and then you move into, you know, World War One. You've got the Wilsons, uh, the Wilson women, um, uh, World War Two. You've got uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, one of the greatest and longest sitting first ladies of all time on through into modern uh, 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 Vietnam, Korean War, the, the conflicts in the Middle East recently, uh, shock and awe, desert storm, the Bush women. Um, you know, the, these women stand by their man. You got uh, Mamie Eisenhower. I mean, it just goes on and on of, of these women standing by these men and consulting in military times. Bess Truman was in the room when conversations were going on whether to drop the atom bomb. I mean, the, 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 the access and, 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 and information that these women are privy to is, is beyond remarkable. And they, and they always have been. Well, and you would think that a husband knowing if he were going to drop an atom bomb would know the impact that's going to take on his him mentally to make that decision that he would want to share it with somebody that could support him or could at least help convince him he's making the right decision. Or, or the other way, or, or yeah, or, you know, or the exact yeah, opposite. It, it, exactly right. You're exactly right. And I'm old enough to remember that when Ronald Reagan was president, he said, "I don't make a single decision without running it by Nancy," and the the public didn't like that. And they said, "Well, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't elect her." But you go, you go back in time to uh, uh, Edith Wilson, Wilson's second wife. After World War II, well, first of all, let me let me back up a little bit. Edith Wilson was was such an intelligent and capable woman, and every night I've seen I've seen this 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 sort of like uh, uh, it's like a portable portable uh, file cabinet almost a portable letter tray. Like you got letter trays on your desk, you know, and you got like inbox, outbox, and to do list. You know, you got your stackable. Now they're plastic. Before they used to be metal. Before that they were wooden. You know, whatever these things, these organizers you put on your desk. Well, President Wilson had one of these. It was kind of like a small mailbox, and and every night. At the end of the day, all the briefings would go into different slots and different drawers in this portable mailbox kind of thing, this organizer, this desk organizer. And President Woodrow Wilson and Edith Wilson would take it up to the residence on the second floor in the middle part of the White House and would go over the business of the day. And he would read letters to her and read memos to her. You go, Rosalind Carter was sat in on nearly every cabinet and administrative and advisory meeting that she was in town for. I mean, these women are right there because they want perspective. Going even further back, Ida McKinley. This is a great story. Ida McKinley used to sit in her husband's outside of her husband's office in Canton, Ohio, when he was when he was governor of Ohio. And a, a visitor would walk in and say, "Oh, hello, Mrs. McKinley. How are you?" And uh, uh, McKinley would William McKinley would 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 usher him into the into the into the room into the office, go to shut the door and and leave his foot out to catch the door so it wouldn't shut all the way. Mrs. McKinley would lean in, listen to the whole conversation. The guest would have no idea. Then at the end of the meeting, McKinley would say, "Okay, well, thanks for coming and seeing me, Steve. Uh, catch you next time. You know, see you at the at the club or see you down the street for dinner. You know, whatever." Off he goes, and then he'd say, Ida, come on in. Tell me what you thought. They need this. We all need to consult. It's why we partner. You know, Barack Obama, uh, 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 George Bush, H.W. and W., uh, Bill Clinton, all of these guys, you know, uh, Gerald Ford, they go upstairs at the end of a long day, and their wife says, hey, honey, how was your day? And he goes, well, the Russians are at it again, or man, Iran's a real pain in my ass. I mean, it's what we talk about. I come home from a day and I say, hey, look, I had a great podcast with, with the heavyweights, man. We had a great time. We chatted about it. We talk about our day with our spouses, with our significant others. It's just what happens. And at the presidential level, they just have a lot more important stuff to talk about. So, I mean, you know, Edith Wilson, at the end of World War I, President Wilson had a stroke. He had a full-blown stroke, incapacitating. He went down and behind closed doors for about six months. And he told the country, and his advisors told the country, he's tired. War is hard on a president. He's exhausted. He needs to rest. He's fatigued. And everyone said, okay, makes sense to me. 
because we didn't need to know what everyone was doing. I mean, now, you know, if we don't see, uh, you know, yeah, Bush riding his bike on the weekend or Obama getting uh, having a, a basketball game on, uh, you know, or, or, or President Trump playing golf, you know, we don't see these guys every day. We get nervous. But back then you could go into hiding. But he had a stroke. And sometimes and, and, we kind of don't want to see so much of Trump. <laughs> well, sometimes a lot of people don't want to see a lot of any of these guys. You know, it's it's very true. And 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 so so Edith Wilson would not let anything go through the bedroom door of President Wilson that didn't get checked out by her. And she said he's in a good mood today. He's in a bad mood. They released interviews to the press that were staged to make it seem like everything was OK. And the president was just resting and ruling from his bedroom kind of thing. But he wasn't half of his body was paralyzed. He even wanted to retire. There was a plan for Wilson to retire. And in a letter I read in Stanton, Virginia, where the Wilson Presidential Library and Museum is, it says it clearly states from his doctor to another uh, high level uh, White House guy. It says the president's plan to retire does not please Mrs. Wilson. We got to come up with another plan. So even down to the point that he was going to say, look, I got to come clean, man. I'm not going to bounce back from this. It's not going to happen. She said, no, you're going to finish out your presidency. You're going to finish out your term. And that leads into the next thing I want to talk about, which is the legacy of these men and, and how these women look after these men long after they're gone. And most of them, just because of the nature of the way things go and, 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 and age and all that kind of stuff, most of these women – long outlive these husbands and then preserve their legacy for future generations. Well, and looking at, at, like you said, with, with Wilson, she essentially served as his chief of staff in the very least. Absolutely. So, I mean, you're talking about a first lady that took on a, what would actually be a paid position as a white house staffer now. 100%. I, it just, it, 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 it is it is such a partnership and it is so important to understand that even if it's official or not official, when these men enter this office and bring their life partner, their spouse, their companion, their wife into this role, they're not going to they're not going to turn and say, hey, I can't tell you that or no, I didn't want you to hear. And it's just it's just not we're human beings. You're exactly right. And I mean, maybe that's something that because they spend so much time in the public mm -hmm. eye, maybe we forget that. I think, I think, I think we do in a, in a large part. I mean, we just, we just, we just, we, we think that there's these clean lines and these definitions or these people, because they've gotten to the point where they're, that they're president, that they're, that they're not human or they're superhuman, or, I mean, we definitely hold them to a higher standard and we should, we absolutely should, but we also have to remember that they are human. And that was such an interesting part of this journey that I did for C-SPAN, the series, First Lady's Influence and Image. And I mean, we care about these women because they're first ladies, uh, because they lived in the White House, because they were married to presidents. But we also have to realize that they are human. They're young girls, they're sisters, they're daughters, they're aunts. Uh, their cousins, their girlfriends, their wives, later on their widows and, and grandmothers, and all of the things that we go through in life. We win, we lose, we live, we die, we laugh, we cry. All of these people do it too. We just don't expect them to because they're president and first lady. But they suffer great losses. Their feelings get hurt when you talk about them. Sure, they're 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 privy to 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 more information and 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 more more world travels and, and, and foreign diplomacy and all the other kind of things and military things that we have to go through and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, they are flesh and blood and they can make mistakes just like we can, and they can have great successes. But the important part to remember about the women is again, I can't say it enough times that they are unpaid and unelected. There's no first ladies 101. There are people that came before them at this point, many people that came before them at this point, and they can look at role models and have examples. But in one letter that I saw at the uh, Massachusetts Historical Society, 
the Adams has kept nearly all of their correspondence. They were very historically minded and, and, and great archivists, uh, not to mention all the, 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 the great minds that they were in, in leadership and forming the country and the Continental Congress and everything. But there is a letter that Abigail Adams, the, it's the rough draft sort of the pencil version. So we know what she wrote to Martha Washington and she saved Martha Washington's reply. And she basically said, how did you do it? You know, how were you first lady in a world? We didn't even call them first ladies at that time. You know, it, she was called Lady Washington and Lady of the Land and Lady Miss Washington. Um, you know, but we didn't have that official moniker of, of first lady until right around the uh, Buchanan administration, just before, uh, before, during and, and after the Civil War is sort of when first lady kind of kind of catches on before that. Um, uh, Dolly Madison was referred to as first lady by president Zachary Taylor, but it was at her funeral and she wasn't the sitting first lady at the time. So the first time an, uh, an actual first lady who's in the white house and alive and in the role of first lady was called first lady was Harriet Lane, but that was Buchanan's niece. So that wasn't even his wife. So it's not until Hayes and, and Lucy Hayes that, 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 a, that a wife, in the White House, married to a president at the time when he's president called first lady. But I'm really getting insider baseball there. Uh, uh, the, 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 the point I was I was making bef before is that there 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 is no blueprint. There are only these people that come before them. And, and what what Abigail Adams said to Martha Washington, this is number two, saying to number one is, how do you do it? And Martha Washington's response was basically just like, you just go with your gut. You figure it out. Do what you think is right for the people and for the country and for freedom, and 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 you just figure it out, man. And and it's incredible to to see at that level that that it is people just going with their gut and doing what they think is best at the time in that situation. Well, and you know that I, I'm surprised at this point, no, though, that you don't see more kind of an orientation almost. Well, you know, I think in modern times it has gotten more of like, a, you know, there is a passing of the baton, a, 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 you know, a, a, a torch exchange sort of thing. And you do have those examples. And you see, uh, speaking of Lucy Hayes, you see her write things in her diaries and in her journals and in her letters uh, and, and public statements that say, like, I respect the women that have come before me. I can only aspire to be as 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 dutiful and good as they are or were um so you know that there there are things in place but there you cannot predict what happens in four or eight years you cannot predict the successes you cannot predict the tragedies you cannot predict uh the outcome of of uh, midterm elections of of uh of, of world events of wars of conflicts my god no one could have predicted 9-11 you know i mean you think about what that had to do as first lady. This is a librarian from Texas. And I'm not saying that to minimize it. I'm saying Laura Bush was a library. She had a master's degree in library and sciences. She wanted to teach uh, kids and, and, and the country to read and better education. And George W. Bush said he didn't want to be a nation builder. He wanted to be a domestic policy president, which makes sense because he was a governor. But I don't get into all that kind of politics and, and and the guys so much but basically they were like american people for america doing things in america for americans and then boom 9 11 happens what no one could have predicted and this is why i have one of the, some of the, the greatest respect for laura bush as a modern 20th century first lady is that or 20 21st century first lady yeah. in the in that she had to completely change, rearrange her mindset, as we all did. I mean, a post 9-11 world is a different world. It is a different enemy. It is a different kind of people that don't like us and want us to fail and, and, and people that we need to protect ourselves against and still be part of a global community and a, and a modern society that works on an international level. And, and, and so it's, it's a delicate mix. But what Laura Bush had to do was she had to represent America. Then she decided to represent women and women's rights and women's education. And she became the most traveled first lady in modern history, going to places that she probably could not find or pronounce on a map 24 hours before. I mean, it just changed everything. And, and we were forced to change our way of life uh, in, in and around D.C., in and around the country and, and, and in the world. But we didn't have to do it representing 
the 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 the, the mega power, the the person that everyone turns to for all the answers, the United States of America. And Laura Bush had to do that, and she had to do it in a role with no uh, no guidelines, no 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 job description, no pay, and and not having won an election or or having even wanted the role necessarily. I mean, they 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 know when their when their husband decides to run for president that he could run. But I mean, think about it statistically, you have a better chance of getting eaten by a shark than being elected president. Well, and if you look at from her standpoint, especially looking at Laura Bush, you have to factor in that the only other attack by foreigners on domestic soil for the United States was Pearl Harbor. Yeah. So you're talking 60 plus years. You're talking a generational change from one event to the next. One hundred percent, and and you're you're also think, oh, go back to Pearl Harbor. You know the the country found out about Pearl Harbor when Eleanor Roosevelt made a radio address. Even FDR, the longest sitting president in history, uh, uh, elected to an unprecedented and unlike you know it's unrepeated. I mean, unless we change the constitution again and say you can have more than two terms as president, but there was still the possibility of endless terms as president. He was elected. Four different times for 12 years, he died in his fourth term, so he didn't serve that fourth term. But that puts Eleanor Roosevelt as first lady for all of those years. And 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 here, this will even blow your mind. FDR would never have run for president if it wasn't for his wife. He discovered that he had polio right about the same time he told his wife that he was having an affair. He basically came home and said, "Honey, I've been having an affair. I got this girlfriend." And I've got polio. So Eleanor Roosevelt said, okay, I'm out of here. Like, I've given you four, five, six, some kids. This day and uh, age, it would be, we're going to get you tested and make sure it's polio first. Well, all of the, <laughs> yeah. Although I hear that's making a comeback. I hear polio is making a comeback with some other thing I saw in the news the other day, but I digress anyway. So, so she basically said, okay, I, I'm, I'm out of here. This doesn't work for me. And Sarah Delano uh, FDR's mom, Eleanor Roosevelt's mother-in-law, said Roosevelt's don't get divorced, and and there's too much money at stake, there's too much pride, there's too much in the family name. You two will stay together, uh, if not happily, then just you know because. And uh, Franklin, you're done with public service because you have got polio. We're going to get you treated, but we've got enough money that neither of you need to work. And you're just going to be Roosevelt's, and you're going to have parties and cotillions, and go to public appearances and do your thing. Well, Eleanor knew if that were the case, she'd be trapped in a house where she didn't even have a designated seat at her own dining room table because FDR's mom took the other head seat at the other side of the table. So she hired a guy named Lewis Howe, H-O-W-E. He was a, a political strategist from Bethesda, Maryland, hired him to get in. And basically, they redesigned a wheelchair that would look like just a regular chair that he could look like he wasn't a cripple and wasn't physically handicapped and all the other stuff. So he could put on this sort of uh, appearance and and just sit at tables instead of stand. And he could still stand for a while. It could sit, actually did a, did a lot of physical things, that, but 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 a lot of things that kept him back. But basically, Eleanor Roosevelt resurrected and maintained his political career, went out on her own, was trained by Lewis Howe to represent her husband and become and have a, a career of her own, a public career of her own, just so she wouldn't be trapped in this house in a loveless marriage. Um for the, for all the rest of her time under the thumb of her mother, a domineering exactly. mother-in-law. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, you know, the, the whole world war II, Pearl Harbor, um, oh, you know, all the stuff that goes along with that, uh, and, and the longest sitting president in history, we basically have his, his, his wife to, to, to thank for that or credit for that. That's just, it's still the, the fact that he got that unprecedented term is still shocking to me. I, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it, I, I really want, it's, it's funny because the way, the way the country and I, and I, 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 I very, very, I, I tread very, very lightly here because I, I hesitate to get into 
anything political, any, but but with the way the fickle nature of the country that just goes back and forth and back and forth and back, I'm really surprised that any president goes two terms anymore because people just in today's day and age, I call it the iPodification of America. As soon as the iPod came out and people stopped buying albums and started buying singles and the internet made instant gratification to think you can get stuff done in a snap, which in most parts you can, but I mean, think about it. You can buy and sell and trade stocks. You can buy a house. You can apply for a mortgage. All zip, zap, zoom. It's on your phone. It's all instantaneous. Well, politics and people don't always work like that. Things need time to take root. Things need time to happen and things like that. And, you know, you go back to like the Great Depression, Herbert Hoover, Herbert Hoover and Lou Hoover, I've said this before on your show, I know, and I say in my books, are probably the two most capable and 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 incredible human beings team, husband and wife team to ever live in the White House. What they did outside of the White House and what they did as Herbert Hoover was the first uh, uh, um, orphan president. I'm sorry. He was the second orphan president. Andrew Jackson was the was the first. Herbert Hoover was a was a was a was an orphan though, being bounced around from family member to family member to family member. He settled down with an uncle or something like that in California because California was giving out free college educations. He didn't have any money. He didn't have any means. So he had to go where his college education would be would be would be free. So he went to Stanford, which is where he met Lou Henry in geology class. He proposed to her in a telegram when he was over in Australia after he graduated before her, proposed to her while he was over there mining gold. She said yes. He took a steamship back to San Francisco, married her, threw her back on the steamship, and then they traveled around the world and became multimillionaires by the age of 30 with with with, with no wherewithal before, or, or family. They didn't inherit anything. They weren't given anything. They earned it. They learned it. Uh, what they did for for in philanthropic endeavors and all this, just great, great, wonderful, wonderful people. Well, they move in, and three months after he's elected, the stock market crashes, and his financial team uh, quits. And people are jumping out of buildings. And no man, woman, child, alien, animal could cause or solve the Great Depression, our greatest economic down point uh, uh, in, in four years. It's just economic cycles don't work that way. And they and they and we could barely maybe even do it in 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 eight years. So you know the 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 you couldn't do it back then. You can't do it now. And I mean, I'm, have I'm we always... have we fully recovered from the recession that hit us not long ago? I don't think so. No, nah, I mean it depends who you ask. You know, I mean, and and that's the whole thing. I, I know a little bit about the economy because I did a documentary for PBS on the economy, and I talked to some great minds on both sides of the aisle uh, uh, during the process of that. And it, they are cyclical, and there's these things called economic bubbles. And when the bubbles burst, if you if you got out at the right time, you're you're sitting pretty. And if you're on the edge of the bubble where it pops, everything blows up in your face. But but then if you're if you're around and you got the money and the wherewithal to pick up all the little particles of the bubble that popped around you, you can turn things like the 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 dot com bubble burst in the 90s uh, that that gave birth and made way for Google. And made way for uh, Amazon and all these other things that the infrastructures were in place to then take them, rebuild them, and use the technology just in a different way for how it develops. A lot of green energy goes that way nowadays. Real estate is like that. I mean, you know, if you were selling houses in in, in the in the, the early 2000s to mid 2000s, and you were making twice what your house was worth. You weren't complaining, and you were thinking the man in charge was the greatest guy thinks of sliced bread or the ballpoint pen. But then, as it does, as these economic cycles go, and 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 then you're underwater, and you're, you're, you've overextended, and you're not getting what you paid for your house, then you're pissed off, and the president you know, stinks. For the most part, because of the way Congress works and the way laws are enacted and the way these economic cycles go, presidents just get lucky or unlucky, and they inherit a good economic cycle or a bad economic cycle. But the point of all this is that you know, FDR got elected that way, and and people were putting their faith in him, and they were elected him. And you know, Bush got two terms, Clinton got two terms, Obama got two terms. I, God knows what's going to happen. You know, in 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 2020, I, I'm I'm always surprised when 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 the American public sticks with someone and, and gives them another four years to either ride the high out or try and keep fixing what they were fixing or. Or, you know, it's just, it's, it's weird. It's, 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 it's weird and, 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 and an interesting thing to, uh, we to are in, at. we are in for a scary election cycle. 
Well, again, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll switch. I'll switch the mood and the tone because um, uh, because I, I, I don't talk politics and I don't talk presidents. I've already said more than 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 I have or, or should just because it's not my area of study. And I'm just I mean, I'm a voting American just like everybody else. But I'm the first ladies man. I love all the ladies equally because they all revealed themselves to be these incredible women and all put some sort of mark on the country, on leadership, on the development, which turned us into the great country we are. And they've just been a part of this leadership and this success and this development from the very beginning. And I've got a first lady that I don't think I, I don't know much about her because you, I, I didn't hear a lot about her. And of course, she was before my time, actually. But uh, Rosalind Carter. Okay. Now tell me what her, I know with Jimmy being the oldest living president now, what was well, her philanthropic efforts during his presidency and after? Yeah, she, well, well, she, she was big and, and this is, this is very interesting. A lot of these first ladies, it's a great first lady to bring up for the reason that we're dealing with a lot of issues now and it's a hot button topic. And again, I'm opening a can of worms here, but mental health. Her big thing was mental health. Um, and, and, and in their post white house life, R Rosalind Carter and Jimmy Carter are two of the most, well, the, the only president that the only president that, um, uh, president and first lady that were married longer, uh, was, uh, George H W Bush and Barbara Bush, and they are now gone. So if the Carters outlive the Bushes, they can break the record for the longest, uh, the longest married president and first lady. Um, now, uh, uh, what they've done in their post White House life, both the Bushes and the Carters, is is historic. I mean, what what Rosalind Carter and Jimmy Carter continue to do with Habitat for Humanity, uh, they both teach Sunday school in their little Baptist church there in Plains, Georgia. They live very minimally. They are not um, they are not extravagant people. They are very humble people. And um, what they continue to do on the world stage with diplomacy and other things are wonderful, too. But Mrs. Carter took a very active role in her husband's uh, in her husband's administration and sat in as a maybe not official or maybe not titled, but an advisor in on cabinet meetings and other things. But her cause was she went out. Now, she didn't have the big fancy slogan like um, Michelle Obama, let's move. Melania Trump, be best. Uh, uh, um, uh, Nancy Reagan, just say no. She didn't have that kind of thing uh, to her, um, but but she was very active in 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 uh, going to Congress and trying to figure out how we can get better mental health treatment for people. And that's a big debate when it comes to a lot of the violence and a lot of the gun control issues and a lot of things. There's some people on 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 one side of the aisle say it's a mental health issue, and the other side says, well, it's a gun control issue. Well, I mean, you know, the, the truth typically lies somewhere in the middle, and mentally stable people do not go and commit mass murders and do not go into schools and things like that. So it's kind of like, you know, people are tripping over the politics of the issue. We end up losing, but there's, there, you know, every Everyone's got a good point to make. It's just what is the what is the solution that makes sense? So uh, Rosalind Carter was a, was was ahead of that um, uh, movement in in the seventies, and she was coming off of the Fords, you know, that were that Betty Ford was ERA. Uh, Betty Ford was big. Betty Ford didn't do her husband any political favors because all of the things that she was standing up for and talking about um, were were things that that her husband's party was not. Um, you know, and, and I'm sure that there were people in President Ford's uh, party that were saying, dude, you got to you got to calm your wife down, man. She's 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 out talking about 60 minutes about all these hot button topics. And when when President Ford uh, was out of office, he said again on 60 minutes, an interview with both President and Mrs. Ford, he said, you know, most times, more times than not, I agreed with my wife in the in the hot button topics, the big political issues of the day where she was talking about abortion and 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 uh, um, um, uh, uh, drugs and 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 uh, um, uh, equal rights, uh, uh, women's rights and, and ERA and things like that. Because more times than not, I, I agreed with my wife. But even if I didn't, some of the stuff where I didn't feel as strongly, it didn't matter. She's her own person. She's her own human. She's her own voice. And she was going to say it, um, you know, regardless. I, and I think that's a that's a really, really it's it's a really important message and something to think about for the time when it came out 
And I know that Jimmy Carter felt and still feels the same way about his wife. I mean, Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter are from Plains, Georgia. You can spit from one end to the other end of that town. There's no taxi service. There's only a couple stoplights. And I don't even think they've been there for very long. And there's almost no life without each other. They were very, very difficult to study as independent people because even Jimmy Carter's mother was the home nurse that took care of Rosalind's father, when he was dying, I, I think cancer, when, when she was a teenager and she, they all went to the same school and Rosalind was best friends with Jimmy's sisters and hung out at the farm all the time. I mean, it's just their lives are co continuously and endlessly intertwined. You know, that's more I've heard more than I've been able to find out about Rosalind Carter, to be honest. And it's Jimmy, you hear plenty about. I mean, hell, I knew more about Billy than at this point than I did Rosalind. Here. Well, here. Well, here's a here's a great thing about my journey and my travels. I don't want to give too much away from the book. We should mention also too, first ladies, uh, you know, firstladiesman.com. Unusual for their time on the road with America's First Ladies, Volume One and Volume Two. I'd love to sign some sets for your listeners. You can get it right there on the store page. I got First Ladies Man T-shirts, all that kind of good stuff. Um, Oh, I got some two XLs in too. I forgot to tell you guys that we got the double X for the he big got boys fat in. boy shirts. We, we got need the big bigger. boy shirts in. We got the big mm. boy shirts. But but um but but it, one of the stories I tell about being in Plains, Georgia is that um is I was having dinner and I was about to have dessert and and uh um the sheriff of the of the small Plains uh Georgia town uh I was I was giving him some information about my day that was incorrect. He said, "How'd your day go with the with the ranger?" Cuz the whole town is basically a national historic site run and and uh by the by the uh the the National Park Service. And this guy named Steve, Ranger Steve, took me around and told me all that he knew about Plains Georgia and Rosalind Carter and her family. And um and uh uh, uh I said something wrong about the church. I said I said, "Oh yeah, I went to the to the Presbyterian, I went to the to the Baptist church where they met and the Presbyterian church where they still teach Sunday school. And from the corner, I heard her voice say, you got it the wrong way. You mixed it up. They they met at the Presbyterian church and they teach at the Baptist church. And the, uh, the sheriff says, I'd listen to her. She's in the family. That's Billy Carter's daughter. So I had dinner with Billy Carter's daughter and her husband. Good Lord. <laughs> Did I'm you have a you, Billy man. beer to wash everything down? I said, and I said, I go, listen, uh, uh, I, I, her name's Karen or Kristen. I forget. It's something with a K. I got so many women running around in my head. I got to keep them straight. So I keep the first lady straight and, and, and but we but, won't tell Heather. Yeah. The kids are the, <laughs> well, she knows, she knows, uh, she, she's, she's one of the biggest, uh, she's my stylist. She's my, uh, my manager. She, she picks out my ties. Uh, and she tells me when I'm when I'm uh, umming and and uhing too much, and and when my information's good, and when the, she's brutally honest, she's 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 a great asset to me. And yet she day. allows you to do this show. Uh, well, you know, we all have we all have momentary lapses of judgment. <laughs> But but um, uh, 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 Karen or Chris, I th I'm almost positive it's Karen. Anyway, uh, uh, she she lives down there in Plains, Georgia, and I and, and was having uh, peanut butter ice cream, homemade peanut butter ice cream with her, and and she that sounds said, divine. I, I, oh, it was it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. They also make good chili there at the something Moose Saloon or something or the Buffalo Lodge. So it's right in the historic uh, motel hotel there in the center of Plains, Georgia. It's the only place to stay in your in, if you're in Plains proper, just right in downtown. And Rosalind Carter uh, uh, did the historic renovation of the building. And there's a number of antique stores and flea market things in the building and the uh, the hotel itself. It's just fantastic. Anyway, I said, I've got some of your dad's beer in my beer can collection in my dad's attic back in Rockville, Maryland. And she laughed and we sat and we had, we had some good stories. And I'll tell you, her husband, Karen's husband, was Billy Carter personal assistant during the White House years, and this dude told me stories over peanut butter ice cream that I was sworn to secrecy, sworn not to repeat or write about or film or discuss, and I keep that promise to her husband, but I'm telling you, if you're in Plains, Georgia, and you run into Billy Carter's daughter and her husband, ask him about going to Las Vegas with Billy Carter back in the day. He'll have some stories for you. And considering it's Memorial Day, it seems appropriate to end on a good beer, doesn't it? 
It certainly does. I wish everyone the happiest Memorial Day. Please remember what it's all about. The veterans, the military families that give so much, and that does include the presidents, the military presidents, and otherwise as the commander in chief and their wives who have historically and since before the the America existed has done so much for our country, for us, for our freedoms. They are the most powerful and influential, unelected and unpaid women. And we owe them a, a, a great debt of gratitude for the service they've given to us and our families and our country over the years. Happy Memorial Day, everyone. Well, Andy, happy Memorial Day to you. Always great to have you on. And we will talk to you again soon, I'm sure. Right on, brothers. We'll talk to you. Take it easy. All right, man.